You couldn't visit major East Coast cities or watch movies in the 70s and the 80s without seeing the iconic checker cabs running around on the streets. They were so common they became part of the background noise. But that hit a fascinating history of an auto manufacturer. This is a far too brief history of checker. Welcome back to All Cars Y'all. I am John and I'll be honest. I. I think almost all of us know that iconic checker cab. We see them in cities and TV shows and in movies, but personally, I've never really given them much thought. I've seen minivans and Priuses and of course, Crown Vicks all used as cabs. So I'd never thought about the checkers or where they really came from. And it all starts with a gentleman named Morris Markin. Now, Morris was born in Smolensk, Russia in 1893 began work at a young age, and by 19 had been promoted to a supervisor in the clothing factory where he worked. In 1913, he took his savings, and at the age of 19, he emigrated to the United States where he spoke absolutely no English, and he ended up having to borrow $25 from a janitor at Ellis Island to pay the bond necessary to enter the country. He made his way to Chicago where he had an uncle and where he worked various jobs eventually working for a tailor. Now this business was successful and when the tailor died he bought the business from the widow, made a name for himself and was successful enough to bring his seven brothers and two sisters to the United States and he went on to make a fortune making uniforms for the United States Army in World War I. The business remained successful after the war and Markin looked to expand his empire. Lomberg Auto Body Manufacturing was the supplier to Commonwealth Motors who were introducing their new Mogul model in 1919. In preparation, Lomberg took a $15,000 personal loan from Morris to expand their business. While the mogul was well received, it sold slowly and when Lomberg defaulted on the loan, Markin took the company over in late 1920 and renamed it Markin Automobile Body. Now, Commonwealth Motors were having their own struggles with slow sales and entered bankruptcy in late 1921. Markin went to them, proposed a stock swap, and took over Commonwealth, combining these two companies into the checker cab manufacturing in 1922. By 1924, Markin was buying up checker taxi operators licenses and finally gained full control of the company in 1937. Interestingly, around this time, Checker was the first cab company to hire African American drivers and the first to require drivers to pick up all fares regardless of race. Oh, and as a side note, in 1929, Morris bought Yellow Cab Company from John Hertz. Yeah, that hurts. At this time in history, there are two things to note about the taxi business. The first is that taxis were originally considered point-to-point -point chauffeur services, primarily for the upper class. And second, that as they grew, the competition for business turned violent. Businesses like hotels or office buildings would often limit access to just one cab company. Corrupt Chicago laws gave licenses to yellow cab drivers to use municipal taxi stands while denying them to checkers drivers. So rival companies' drivers would engage in brawls that sometimes resulted in deaths, including outright warfare between pro and anti-unionization supporters. So between 1922 and 1928, Markin expanded his taxi cab influence, buying companies in New York, Pittsburgh, and Minneapolis. And sadly, the violence often spread to these new cities with their expansion. In fact, Morris's home was even firebombed in 1923, so he decided to move manufacturing out of Chicago and to Kalamazoo. Checker's first car was the 1923 Model C, an updated version of the Mogul, and it proved popular. Morris expanded, controlling not only sales and distribution to other taxi fleets, including in New York, Boston, Minneapolis, and of course Chicago, but also having an insurance company to cover them. Following this model were the H, the H2, the EF, and the G, with the G being the first to offer a six-cylinder as an option. All previous models were four-cylinders. And in 1928, they unveiled their all-new model, the K. 
Now, taxis at this time were large, well-appointed, and essentially limousines. The Model K performed well as it was stylish, comfortable, and both durable and reliable, and was now a purpose-built taxi design. It had a 127-inch wheelbase and a Buddha six-cylinder making all of 27.3 horsepower as the only engine option. It was a hit and made Checker one of the top two taxi cab builders in the U.S., with the other being Yellow Cab, which by this point was owned by General Motors since 1925. The Model M was an all-new design on a modified K chassis and introduced in late 1930. It had a shorter wheelbase at 122 inches, a far more powerful Buddha six-cylinder engine making 61 and a half horsepower, and a distinctive style that made it instantly recognizable even in the dark. By now the Great Depression was raging and while at first the company remained profitable, by 1932 Checker began losing money. The board of directors forced Morris out. But Morris had met E.L. Cord years before and struck up a friendship. So he reached out to Cord and asked him to take a controlling interest in Checker and to reappoint Morris as president. While Markin only controlled about 5% of the stock, he had options for 60%. And he sold these options to Cord for less than a million dollars and Checker was integrated with Auburn Cord Duesenberg. Checkers began cribbing Auburn style and using a Lycoming straight eight in their next car called the Model Y. Now this model was introduced in 1934 with several innovations and more style. It was a three box design with an integrated body trunk, a first in the auto industry, and glass windows in the roof for sightseeing. Styling was heavily influenced by Auburn and used their 148 horsepower inline eight, the same as in the Auburn 850, in 1936, they offered a Continental six-cylinder as an option, and this model was produced until 1939. Importantly, Checker was also a third-party supplier of body stampings, including truck bodies for Hudson, Ford, and REO motor car. Now, on or about 1936, the SEC was investigating Cord and Markin for questionable dealings in the Checker stock, and how it jumped from a price of about $7 a share to $69 a share between 1935 and 1936. Morris successfully bought back his company from Cord right before Cord ending up losing his businesses. In 1939, the Model A was introduced. It was roomier, it was the first checker to move away from taxis as limousines, removing the divider between the driver and the passenger. Other features such as a landelette top and glass roofs were included and patented by the company. The driver's seat could adjust 15 different ways, a vent directed fresh air into the driver compartment, and the driver was now protected from the elements for the first time they were heated, all to help them drive on longer shifts. This model was only made for two years before production stopped for World War II. Now during the war, Checker built retrieval trailers, tank recovery vehicles, and other types of trailers such as for petroleum. They'd also partnered with American Bantam to build four prototype Jeeps that were both four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering. Now, it was rumored that during the war, Morris had all the body tools and dies melted down. So after the war, it was a challenging situation of having to design and produce an all-new car. To handle this, he reached out to two outside consultants, Herbert Snow and Ray Dietrich. Snow had worked for Cord and was the engineering mind behind the front-wheel drive system for them. Dietrich had worked for Briggs, LeBaron, and Chrysler and was famous for his redesign of the Chrysler Airflow that arguably saved Chrysler. Starting as the Model B and then the Model C, Snow proposed a rear-engine, rear-wheel drive car to minimize weight and maximize space. Using a Continental six-cylinder and a three-speed manual, it also used the front and rear suspension, brakes, and wheels from a Studebaker. During test, it was found to handle poorly on its short 100-inch wheelbase, and a decision to have passenger seating like a train where one row faced the other was questionable, so the project was killed. They then moved on to the Model D, which was again unconventional. This time, it was a front-wheel drive vehicle with a transverse engine. 
The wheelbase was stretched to 112 inches, but with a total length of just 189.5. It was attractive, but during over 100,000 miles of testing, it too was rejected. The car actually performed very well, with real-world testing showed it had excellent ride quality, handling in the snow, and comfort on the highway. However, it would be more expensive to produce, and with higher maintenance costs for a front-wheel drive system, Checker believed it would turn off taxi operators. Scrambling, the company quickly developed the Model A2 using the chassis and engine configuration of the pre-war Model A, but with the recent Model D body. With a 124-inch wheelbase and a length of 205 inches, it used that Continental six-cylinder engine, and it took a year to develop, being unveiled in December of 1946. Some amenities, like the previously mentioned driver vent, disappeared. The next year, they introduced the A3, their first entry into the non-taxi market and intended to be sold to limo companies. It was an upgraded and slightly more luxurious model with seating for up to nine. It was also the first model Checker began offering to the public. The A4 and the A5 followed in 1950 with a slight increase in length, as well as larger windows, seats, and a grille. Three years later, the A6 and the A7 came out as a taxi and a limo, respectively. The primary difference from the A4 and the A5 was the raised roof for more headroom. By 1956, the next model was ready, called, unsurprisingly, the A8 and was designed to meet the new standards from New York City limiting the wheelbase of taxis to 120 inches. This model introduced the basic body shape that came to define Checker until the 1980s, although the first year had single headlights. The basic chassis was still familiar to the 1939 Model A, and the drivetrain retained its Continental F226i6 engine. In 1958, the A9 was a restyled version of the A8 with dual headlights and a revised grille, and shortly after introduction began marketing the cars to the public. The first of these was the A10 with the taxi equipment removed and offered in a four-door sedan and station wagon bodies. In 1961, the A11 was introduced, and this model stayed in service until the company stopped production in 1982. In 1962, the company switched from the Continental engine to a 3.8-liter Chevy inline-six and an optional 4.6-liter V8. While the Continental was an old-fashioned L-head design that produced only 89 horsepower, it was overbuilt for longevity. The company had been losing money on each engine, and when they tried to raise prices, Checker simply dropped them and moved to Chevy. It kicked off Checker using more and more Chevy parts over the coming decades, including transmissions, steering columns, and much more. The model was constantly updated to meet new safety and emissions standards, but sales began to slowly fall. Keep in mind, this company could be profitable with six to 7,000 sales a year, but that largely precluded designing a replacement. With the A8, the A9, the A11, Checker began selling to consumers. Originally in 1960, they introduced the Superba with a rename to the Marathon later. Between 1960 and 1968, they sold about 1,000 vehicles a year to consumers, but in 1969, that dropped to 760, and it never reached 1,000 a year again. Throughout the 1970s, taxi companies increasingly began using autos from the big three, as Checker was increasingly out of date, big, heavy, slow, and with poor fuel economy. The body stamping equipment was quickly reaching 20 years old, and the cars required manual labor to actually get the panels to fit properly. The price had also slowly climbed into Buick territory, and it was still a basic design. The company didn't have the money or the vision to design a replacement. While the consumer products, such as the A12 Marathon, had a following based on their rugged and reliable designs, at their price they still had rubber mats and hardboard ceilings. Variations of the car were available in the 60s and 70s through special luxury editions, the Metacar and the Aerobus. In July 1982, the last Checker Auto was produced and the company left auto manufacturing. But that's not the end of the story. First, the last Checker cab in New York City retired in 1999 with 994,972 miles. 
Second, Checker changed tack and became a subcontractor providing parts and stampings to other manufacturers. Those other areas of the business also continued to expand, including the Yellow Cab in Chicago, their insurance company manufacturing truck trailers, and more. Some were sold off to other companies, while Checker Motors made body stampings for various GM truck lines and chassis components for some Cadillacs. By 2008, the Great Recession was upon us and auto sales collapsed. In January 2009, the company declared bankruptcy. At the time, they were working with GM, Chrysler, Ford, Navistar, and GM China. During the bankruptcy proceedings, they were allowed to continue working on a limited capacity for General Motors, and they found two potential buyers, Narmco Group and Van Robb, both of Canada. Now, Narmco offered $650,000 for the stamped metal and welding assemblies for GM trucks and vehicles, and Van Robb paid just $950,000 for some of their other manufacturing equipment. In both cases, manufacturing was moved to Canada where parts of the Buick LaCrosse were now being made. In 2010, Checker headquarters was sold for just under $3 million and the company truly ceased to exist. To me, Checker always just was. It was that part of the background noise or the fabric of these big cities and I never really considered the fascinating story and the sad ending to this car. With a focused market, shrewd business, and low overhead, they existed far longer than most of their contemporaries, and it's kind of sad to see them gone. But what I haven't included in this video is the soap opera-like story around the man who escaped from Tsarist Russia and had seemingly endless encounters with the law. Multiple SEC investigations, antitrust lawsuits from owning both the taxi companies and the manufacturers of the cabs, even to the end when the then CEO David Marking fell victim to Bernie Madoff and his Ponzi scheme, and his name appeared five times in the list of victims. Unfortunately, most of these cars were worked hard and retired when there was nothing left to give, so few exist for collectors. But boy, what I like to drive one. Uh, thanks for watching, and thanks to my Patreon supporters. Be sure to check out the bonus episode I'm going to do where I talk about the four failed attempts to replace that last checker model, some of which were truly harebrained. Thanks for being here, guys.